So I'm excited, uh, excited for this morning. So grateful to be here at the bridge. Uh, excited to get into the topic of human relationships again today. The things that can go right with those and the things that can very easily go wrong with those as well. We've been looking at that, at that from Paul's correspondence with the Corinthians. And one of the main issues that just keeps on popping up in all kinds of ways is that they had taken the blueprint given to them from their culture about how to conduct yourself in relationships. And they had just applied that to their life in the church without really thinking about how the gospel was to transform those relationships. And today we're going to look at, especially at how that happened in this, we, we could call it the area of social stratification the way that the kind of the rich, the higher status in Corinth were, were getting different treatments than the, the lower status, the poor. So we're going to look at how that played out, especially around the Lord's Supper. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and uh, we'll pray and then invite you to open up your Bible if you have one to that part. So Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. And the words that we've been singing, the things that we have been praising you for, Oh, Lord, I, I pray that our hearts would be soft because we can sing those words, we can hear those things, and, um, and we're just going through the motions. But I, I pray, Lord, that the, the truth and the depth of it would hit us in a fresh way, Lord, because if it hits us, if we, really, if we really understand what you did at the cross, if we really understand how great you are, then life can't be the same. So I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit through the words that we've sung, but now, Lord, through your, your word, the Holy Scriptures, that you would speak to us and that you would shape us and form us so that we would not be the same. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, we're going to read this in a few sections. So starting in verse 17, verse 17 to 22. Paul says, in, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Just in case they were wondering. Paul is not giving them praise for this. Um, as we often do, let's look at the context first. Let's, let's kind of set the scene for what's going on in Corinth because that's what Paul is doing in these verses, but we can, we can fill in some of the gaps even from some of the evidence we have. Uh, first piece of uh, context is that, so the, the issue is something to do with the Lord's Supper, obviously, and the Lord's Supper in the first century church was practice very differently than it is in most of our 21st century Western churches. So in churches like ours, uh, communion, as we would call it, or the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, it happens kind of in the context of a worship service, right? You're, you're all gathered together here. You're, you're in some kind of auditorium. At some point in the service, you come and you get a little itty bitty crumb of bread and a little thimble of bread grape juice if you're a no-fun Baptist, or a, a wine if you're a free-for-all Catholic. It depends on where you're coming from. Uh, you just kind of take that, take a little morsel, drink, drink the sip, that's it, right? That's what happens. But in the first century world, the Lord's Supper was actually part of a legitimate meal. You were eating a common dinner together. Uh, and so usually it, it seems from the evidence that you would perhaps, um, as part of your gathering together, you would eat a meal, you would have the bread that remembers the, the body of Christ at the beginning of the meal. And then at the end of the meal, you would, you would drink this cup of, I hate to break it to all of you teetotalers, but it, was, it would have been wine back then. Uh, you would drink a cup of wine at the end. And, and that would kind of be the, the, the kind of the book ends to this, to this meal together. And uh, that, that kind of has to do with where the early church met. The early church did not meet in church buildings like, like this. Uh, the Romans weren't about to let those weirdo Christians establish themselves in that way. So that wasn't an option. They were meeting in, in private homes. 
And it's interesting when you see some of the archaeological finds about what these Roman homes looked like. So I think we've got, I think we've got a little picture up here, a little diagram. Um, so for, for meals, let's say, uh, there would be the, the triclinium there. There's kind of that like three, literally means three couches. That's where they would eat their, their dinners. And so if, if somebody was hosting a meal, if the, if the homeowner, this is obviously a wealthy home, but the homeowner's hosting a meal, uh, the, the people who are kind of closest to him or to her, same status, same class, they would be eating in the triclinium. So that would be maybe 10 people or so. And the rest of the people, the servants, the slaves, the lower class people, they would be eating in the atrium. So that would seat maybe another 40, 50 people or something like that. So that's kind of the, the size of gathering that we're talking about. Now, if you were eating a meal, a joint meal together with people, um, that, that status and class difference actually had to do with the kind of meal you were eating as well. So in most settings in, in our day today, if you're eating a meal together with other groups of people, you're probably all getting equal access to the food, right? It's usually how it goes. Uh, in the first century Greco-Roman world, not so much. So, so one of the ways this would happen would be you'd have these meals where everybody was responsible for bringing their own food. And then you would just eat whatever you brought. You wouldn't be sharing it with others. They weren't into potlucks back then. And, and that does sometimes happen in our day. You know, sometimes we, uh, we have a picnic with some other families and everybody brings their own food. But it's kind of a recipe for disaster too because your kids are looking at what everybody else is eating and they're like, man, everybody else is eating hot dogs and chips and we're eating carrots and sandwiches. And so now they're flipping over tables, metaphorical tables and righteous anger. You know, there's all this comparison and jealousy going on. It's not good, right? It's better if everybody has access to the same, to the same food. So note, Carolyn, we're not doing this anymore. We're not doing the bring your own meal thing. It's not a good idea. The other way that this would happen in the first century Greco-Roman world was that the host of the meal would provide the food for everybody. But here's the kicker, different people would get different amounts and different kinds of food, again, depending on their status, depending on their proximity to the, uh, the, the host of the meal. So a first century Roman poet named Juvenal, we have this quote from him. He says, since I am asked to dinner, why is not the same dinner served to me as to you? You take oysters fattened in the Lucrine Lake. I suck a mussel through a hole in the shell. You get mushrooms, I get hog funguses. A turtle dove gorges you with its bloated rump. There is set before me a magpie that's died in its cage. Why do I dine without you? Although, Ponticus, I'm dining with you. He's a little bit upset about this. I don't know if you picked up on that. And <laughs> I don't, I've never had a hog fungus before. But I would say if you're going to make that a viable menu item, you might want to change the name of that. That's... It's about as unappealing <laughs> I've ever heard of food. So, so this would happen. It wasn't uncommon for, uh, for those class distinctions to decide who was getting what and, and, and how much food. So that, that kind of thing was going on. Here's another piece of, uh, of, of context to kind of help us understand what's going on here. We know that grain shortages were a pretty frequent thing in the first century world. And we actually know that in the early 50s AD, which was the time when Paul was writing this letter to the Corinthians, that in the early 50s AD, there were significant grain shortages in Corinth. There were food shortages, which obviously drove the prices way up. And we know that in settings like that, in times like that, the rich would become even more protective and, and anxious about what they had because they were afraid that all the, the plebes would come and ransack their stashes, their hordes of food. So you put that all together. And by the way, I think that's what Paul, in, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, uh, because of the present crisis, I think that it's good for a man to remain as he is. Commentators think that's probably what he's referring to, that there is a significant famine going on in Corinth. And he's saying, hey, guys, you maybe shouldn't make any major life decisions. You maybe shouldn't start a family right now, given how challenging things are right now. So you put all of these pieces together, and this is kind of the picture that you get. You've got a church in Corinth with a large number of poorer, lower social status people, uh, and then a few of the rich as well, a few of the higher status people. And, there, and there's this division between them. 
And that confusing verse in verse 19 where, where Paul says, no doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval, some commentators think that's probably actually a sarcastic comment. That, that, that some people in Corinth are kind of going, well, obviously we are more favored by God because we've, we've, got, we've got stuff, we've got food, we've got, we've got money. Now you might think, well, that's a terrible way to think. Nobody today would think that way. Uh, no, there are people who think this way still, right? That, that riches are a sign of God's favor, and if other people don't have it, it's their fault. You know, God just doesn't love them as much. What can they do about it? I think you see that kind of thing a little bit in health and wealth churches. This attitude that if you have faith, that God wants to make you wealthy and, and healthy. And if you aren't wealthy or healthy, it's probably because you don't have enough faith. Again, it's, it's because you're just not being favored by God. I just go, oh. I think, I think it's what Paul is saying here. He's like, you guys think this way. And he's, he's going to correct them about this. So, so back to Corinth. You've, you've got that going on. You've got this, um, these grain shortages, food shortages that are causing the rich to become more protective and the poor to become more desperate. And you've got this, this setting where it's acceptable for a host of a meal to serve different portions and, and different kinds of food to, to people depending on their class. You put all that together, this church is coming together to the Lord's Supper and they are eating separately. The rich are devouring their food, gobbling the wine, getting drunk, all the while the, the poor, the lower status people are out perhaps in the outer atrium just scrounging together whatever scraps they can have, they can get. So that, that's kind of what's going on in Corinth. What's Paul's assessment of that? What does he think? What, what letter grade would he give them on their report card for this? He says, I've got nothing good to say about this. He says, you're, you're actually doing more harm than good. You see, that's, that's interesting. It's possible to do a good thing like gathering together as a church and to do it for the wrong reasons, to be doing it to just stir up dissension, to, to exert your own kind of status and power over others. You could do the right thing for the wrong reason. Paul says you would be better off just staying at home given this. And then Paul gets really serious. He says, you are in fact despising the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing. Now, they, they didn't think that they were doing that. They didn't think they were despising the church. They would have said, look, this is just what you do in our culture. This is just, this is how everybody acts. This, we're just following suit. Paul says, actually, you are despising the church, the body of Christ. You are sinning directly against God. By doing this. Now, before we move on to what Paul kind of says, they sh how they should think, I, I just want to say some of you might read this and you might go, well, I, I, I'm good. Like, I'm, this is not a problem for me. When I'm at church and I'm taking communion, I take the same thimble sip of grape juice that everybody else does. I don't ask for anything more. When I have people over for dinner, I give everybody the same amount of hog funguses. Everybody, <laughs> everybody gets the same amount of that. But here's a question. You may give everybody you invite over the same amount, but who do you invite over in the first place? You know, do you, do you only invite those that you kind of see as being on the, the same level as you? Or, or are you inviting a variety of people? When, when you come to church on a Sunday, who do you make a beeline for? Do you, do you just look for the people who are most like you, think like you, look like you, that you think you'll, you know, you'll, you'll connect easily with? Or do you actually seek out those who might not be like you and, and build relationships with them? When you see a, a brother or a sister in need, when you hear that somebody's in need, is your first reaction, well, thank the Lord that I'm not that person that he has blessed me and that's not my problem? Or do you go, okay, how can I help lift this person up? How do I equip them? See, it might be a culturally conditioned issue in Corinth around the Lord's Supper, but at the root of it, there's a heart issue. There's a social issue that goes far deeper. I think to help bridge this gap, there's a, there's a passage where Jesus speaks about our, our habits in terms of who we eat with. He says, when you give a lunch or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they might invite you back. That would be a terrible thing. They might cook for you. They might be terrible cooks. 
So that's why you shouldn't be afraid of inviting me over for dinner because I won't, I won't, I won't invite you back uh, to, to make you food. Uh, you'll be, they'll invite you back and you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. Although they can't repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus is saying followers of his are to disregard this natural human tendency to just kind of want to hang out with people who are you, you kind of view as being the same level or preferably a bit higher than you so you can climb the social ladder. Jesus is saying do the opposite, downward mobility. Forget that whole way that, that, that other humans, you know, kind of operate socially and follow me, Fo follow Jesus. We'll talk about what that looks like in a little bit. Now, I, I want to give an example for my life before we move on to the next section. Um, it's not going to make me look good, but so be it. When I was, uh, so I went to a small little Bible college in, in Steinbach, Manitoba, and I, I loved it. Loved, I loved it. I, I, but oh yeah, yeah, you, yeah, there I am. That's, that's 20-year-old Craig right there. I don't know if I really, I don't know if I really look that much different, to be honest. <laughs> haven't really grown up yet. Um, so I, lo I loved every moment of it. I had such a great time, uh, made so many good friends, had deep conversations, created incredible memories. I came so alive there uh, socially and, and spiritually and academically, not financially so much, but every other way really came alive there. And when I graduated, I just had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I uh, moved into a trailer home with a couple of my buddies, uh, which that's a whole other cachet of stories there, uh, and, and applied for a job at Lowen Windows, which was one of Steinbeck's biggest employers. And I was content to do that. I was content to spend my 20s just hanging out with friends, making windows, you know, living out the good old days. I had a, a sense that pastoral ministry might, might be something God was calling me to, but I thought that's a long ways away. So that, that's kind of how I thought I'd spend my time. Um, one day I was on my college website and I saw this job ad for a church in Wainwright, Alberta. And there was nothing about that that really appealed to me. It, meant, it would mean leaving Steinbeck which is going to sound like a weird thing for those of you who have who, um, who have never heard of Steinbeck before. It's going to sound even weirder for those of you who have heard of Steinbeck before. Like leaving, that would be difficult. It was. It was, it was, it was so challenging. But I, I kept on seeing this job ad and really believed that the Holy Spirit was kind of nudging me to that. So I applied. I, I was hired. I moved out to Wainwright. There, there it is. Uh, there's Wainwright, there's buffaloes and stuff. Um, and and I, have to, I have to tell you, so I was an intern in a church there for one year. And for the first seven or eight months, I was, I was miserable. I was so lonely uh, because I could not get over the fact that I wasn't in college anymore. I couldn't get over the fact that, that I wasn't with my, my buddies anymore. And it wasn't that there were no young adults in that church that I was serving in. There were, but I just... Again, this is where, where, where I, I, I'll be honest with you about some ugliness in my heart. I just, I kind of looked at them. I was like, nah, like they're not, they're not the same as, as, as my Bible college friends. Like they just don't measure up, you know? They, they don't have the same education. We can't have the same conversations. None of them like basketball. They all like country music, which is the worst. You know, like how am I supposed to hang out with them? And I just, like, I, I just had this mentality for seven, eight months. I just, I was just miserable. And I, I mean, I was like, I was sad. I was pathetic. I'd call the dorm in, at, at, from, in Steinbach and I'd just talk to whoever, uh, like, answered the phone, right? I was just like, oh man, it's Craig calling again. Who's going to talk to him? I mean, <laughs> it's pathetic. <laughs> See, this is, I, I think we're all vulnerable to this, aren't we? We're all vulnerable to this kind of social snobbery, this social pride where we see ourselves on a certain level and we're like, well, I don't really want to hang out with people who I don't see as being at the same kind of class, the, the same, same as me, you know? They're not going to do much for me, so I'm just going to kind of like stay away. I think we're all vulnerable to that. So let's look at, at what Paul says about this. He goes, he goes back to the Lord's Supper which is kind of the place where these divisions, these social divisions are especially being worked out. And here's what he says in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, before we talk about what this kind of says to us about, about the Corinthians dining etiquette, let's, let's talk about the theology of the Lord's Supper that Paul brings out here. First thing Paul says is, is he says this, this, um, this meal, this Lord's Supper that Jesus instituted, that he did it on the night that he was betrayed, the night before, before he was crucified. Now this is, this is verbal participation time. Who betrayed Jesus? Good work, everybody. That's it. That's the only time you can talk today. You did it. Judas. Judas was the one who betrayed Jesus. And Judas was a disciple of Jesus. And here's the kicker. Judas, who betrayed Jesus, was at the Lord's Supper. He was there. We know that from the Gospels. In the Gospel of Luke, we go through the whole, the bread and the cup. And after all of that, Jesus, Jesus says that the one who is going to betray him, his hand is, is at the table right there. Judas was at the table. And so I, I sometimes, uh, I wonder about this because I, you know, I, I know that in some traditions, the pastor or whoever is kind of leading the Lord's Supper is supposed to fence the table is actually how it's sometimes phrased. They're supposed to kind of say, well, these are the people that cannot be taking this and here are the people who can. And in some churches, it gets really strict. It's like, well, only baptized members of this church can take the Lord's Supper. And I just look at this and I think, well, I mean, Judas, Judas was there. This, this meal from the start was not one that was just all the pure and the righteous. I, I just think if Jesus was willing to go forward with this meal with Judas at the table, then I, I think we can go forward with this meal even if we don't know for sure where everybody is, is at. So this was the night that he was betrayed and, and Paul quotes the words of Jesus saying, this is my body, which is for you. This, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It says, this is my body. Now, on the basis of this, some, some Christians throughout history have kind of thought that, well, the, the bread and the wine actually literally become the body and the blood of Jesus. And, and before we go down that road, just a couple of things to consider. One is even that, that word, uh, those words, this is, when it's in that same construction in the original Greek language, it doesn't necessarily mean that something is identified as something else, that they're the same. It can be that one thing represents another thing. And I think that's what's going on here. Jesus says that they are to take this and eat it and drink it in remembrance of him. So this meal, the, the bread and the wine, they are to be a physical and tangible reminder of what God has done in terms of bringing about salvation. That's what the Passover meal was. And a lot of people think that the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, is a Passover Seder meal. And that meal, the, the bread and the bitter herbs and the wine and, and all the stuff that they ate, it was all a physical and tangible reminder of the salvation that God had brought about from slavery in Egypt. And in the same way, the Lord's Supper is a physical and tangible reminder of how God has brought about salvation from slavery to sin through Jesus. Sometimes Christians have idolized the meal but the meal isn't the point. The bread and the, and the wine is not the point. The point is what the meal points to. We've idolized the meal and forgotten what it's, what it's supposed to remind us of. So it's, it's first and foremost, it's a remembrance. It's to point us to the cross, point us to what God has done. And then, and, and then we, we would ask, well, what are we supposed to remember? Let's talk about that a little bit more. That comes out really clearly in the words about the cup, where Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. There's two Old Testament passages that, that Jesus is kind of bringing together there. One is in Exodus 24. So in Exodus 24, God has rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. He's brought them out, saved them by grace, not because of anything they've done, but by grace. He's brought them out, and then he establishes a covenant with them. And a covenant is a relationship where you, both, both parties, are making certain promises and commitments as they enter into this 
relationship. Think more of a marriage here, less of a, a business contract. And, and this covenant, you know, when you get married, you maybe seal the covenant with exchanging rings. It's a little bit more morbid in Exodus 24, <laughs> where this, the covenant is sealed by Moses taking the blood of bulls that have been sacrificed and sprinkling the blood on the people. And the idea here is that that blood represents the curse of breaking the covenant. This is what happens if you break the covenant. And, and so Moses says, this is the blood of the covenant the Lord has made with you. It gives a whole new uh, meaning to the term bloodbath, doesn't it? Just, boy. <laughs> so that's, that's in Exodus 24. A new covenant sealed in the blood of bulls. Now, centuries later, you come to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah is a prophetic book that's full of lament. Full of lament because, because Israel has failed so spectacularly, so often to uphold their end of the covenant. And, and so this whole book, it's not, it's not a very cheery book because there's, there's destruction and there's death and there's exile as a result. But in Jeremiah 31, we get a glimpse of hope where God speaks through Jeremiah, says the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So here God is saying, I'm gonna make a new covenant where I'm going to embed my ways in my people and they will be my people in a whole new way, in a much deeper way than before. And here at the Last Supper, you've got Jesus centuries later saying that new covenant has come to fulfillment right here. This is what Jesus is doing. Jesus right here is establishing this new covenant covenant. And he's doing it, he's sealing it, not with the blood of some sacrificial animal, but with his own blood. He is giving himself in place of covenant breakers. He's bearing the curse of covenant breaking on himself. And now entry into this relationship, into this covenant, it's not based on ritual obedience. It's based on faith in Jesus. Do you, I mean, you just think about this. Think about who God is. Think about how God is almighty, Lord of heaven and earth, creator of all things. Think about how God is holy and pure and righteous. Think about how God is, is from everlasting to everlasting, first and the last, eternal, immortal. And think about who you are, who I am. We don't check any of those boxes. Not a single one of those things can be applied to us. We are frail, we're broken, we're sinful, we're weak. If ever there was a gap between two parties, it was here. If ever one party was just way too good for the other, way above them, if ever there was a time where one party should not even bother with another, it was here. That gap between God and us was massive. And yet in the incarnation, God took on flesh. He came into our world and he bore, he shouldered the ugliest, lowest, darkest stuff that we had to throw at him. He went all the way to the cross, dying the shameful, humiliating death. And he did that all so that by grace, he would reconcile us to himself. He would bridge that gap. He would welcome us into relationship with God. Do you understand how unworthy you are of this? See, our culture's always talking about what are you, what do you deserve? What are you worth? I gotta tell you, you're not worthy of God. You're not worthy of his love and his grace, but he pours it out anyways. See, this is what we remember when we come to the Lord's Supper. We remember how weak and broken and failing we were, and yet his great love for us in Jesus has brought us to himself. We remember how he has bridged that gap. And so at the very least, when we remember that, in the context of our church community, 
Because that's where we do it. That's where we, we participate in the Lord's Supper is together with the family. When we do that, we also remember that if he has shown us that grace, how dare we not show a, a, even a glimpse of that grace to others? How can we possibly come? How can we possibly come to church, come around the Lord's Supper and have an ounce of pride within us and think that we're somehow above other people, that there's, there's something that, we, you know, they're unworthy of our attention. Are you kidding me? Look at the cross. Look at that, that, that gap that he has bridged. This is why what was happening in Corinth was such a big deal. Because the manner in which they were taking the Lord's Supper was directly contradictory to what the Lord's Supper is supposed to remember and proclaim about what Jesus has done for us. So with all that in mind, here's how Paul then applies his theology of the Lord's Supper to their situation. Verse 27. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That's why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we're judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who's hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I'll give further directions. Let's start with a couple of verses there that I think probably grab our attention. We go, whoa, what is, what's happening here? Because you've got Paul saying that it's possible to eat and drink judgment on yourselves and that some of the Corinthians have actually become weak and sick and have even fallen asleep. And in case you were wondering, they didn't just take a nap. That's a euphemism for death, that some people have actually died. On the basis of this, I, I can't remember who it was. It might have been one of you, and you're like, hey, you shouldn't be talking about this, but I don't remember who it was, so I think I'm fine. I remember somebody coming to me and saying, I haven't taken communion in years and years because of this verse, because they were so terrified of eating or drinking in an unworthy manner and opening themselves to a judgment like this. So let's, 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 let's kind of work through this a little bit. What is Paul talking about? It could be that Paul is saying that because of the waywardness of the Corinthian church, that God is directly inflicting some of them with, with sickness and, and even, even death. It could be. I mean, there, there are instances, rare instances in the New Testament, like with Ananias and Sapphira or King Herod in the book of Acts, where you do see that kind of thing happening, where somebody has sinned and God's like, judgment. It could be. I, I want us to be really, really, really careful here, though, because it is definitely not true that whenever somebody is sick, it's because God is directly kind of punishing them for something they've done. There's so much in the Bible that would not lead us to that conclusion, that would lead us in the opposite conclusion. So we gotta be really careful with that. But it could be that in some circumstances, and Paul, as uh, one who has a prophetic gift, might know that that's what's happening in Corinth. That could be. I think there might be a simpler explanation, though. It could be that some of the Corinthians are weak and sick and are even dying simply because of malnourishment. Remember the grain shortages. Re remember how scarce food is becoming in Corinth. And remember how little the rich are caring for the poor in this church. If, if that's the case, if you, have, if you have people who are not getting sufficient nourishment, are growing sick, are even dying of those sicknesses, then, then it could be that God is allowing that to kind of run its course as a judgment on the church in Corinth, as a way of saying, look, you guys, look at the lack of love that exists among you right now. Look at what's taking place. To go back to something I said last week, um, Jesus, actually in John 13, on the night that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he, to he told his disciples that he was giving them a new command, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. 
Again, this is such a, a huge part of our witness to the world. And I, I see that, I hear that here at the bridge at various times. I, I know I've, I've heard from people who are going through really, really difficult, challenging times and they have experienced the love and the compassion of people in this church and they're telling other people about that. And it, it, makes, it makes Jesus look really good. The tragedy in Corinth is that the opposite is happening that they are not loving one another, that they're not caring for one another, that there are these divisions, and as a result, there is this, this judgment. The church isn't looking good. Jesus isn't looking good because of how the church is, is relating to one another. And, and that, I think, gets to what Paul means by examining and discerning. Some people have this idea that, that it's like this introspective perfectionism that you kind of look at your life before taking the Lord's Supper, and if you find any area of your life where you're not totally perfect yet, you're like, oh, I'm out, can't do it, can't do it this week, which has always seemed strange to me. Because the whole point of the Lord's Supper is that you're a sinner in need of grace. See, I, I come to the table as I am recognizing my desperate need for the love of God. I think this is the crucial question. It's, it's not about this introspective perfectionism. I think it's about what is your heart as you come to the Lord's Supper? Because if you come pridefully, if you come going, yes, I've got it all figured out. I'm a great Christian. I'm doing really well. I'm so much better than everybody here. Let's go. Take the bread and take the juice. I've got this. It's the wrong place for you. Don't do it. Because that's not what this is about. Your, your heart is in the wrong place. And that's the discerning, the examining that Paul is looking at. This is all about humility. This is all about people coming to the table, coming to this reminder of what Jesus has done and recognizing their desperate need for grace, that all of us together, no matter what our, no matter what our earthly status is outside these, these walls, no matter how people view us, no matter how much money we make, what job title we have, how popular we are, how many followers we have on Instagram, it means nothing right here. It means nothing at the table. Because before the foot of the cross, the ground is level. We are all in the same boat needing this grace. And so this is Paul's, woo! This is Paul's final appeal. He, he says to them, so when you come together then, share with each other, eat together. Receive one another is another translation of that. The rich are putting the poor to shame because they're eating different amounts. Paul's saying, put an end to that. If you've got to do that, if you've got to gorge on your roasted turtle dove, you know, <laughs> do, do that at home. But here, when you're together, share with one another. There, there, there's to be an equality here. You know, you're, you're all together as one body. In the very next chapter, Paul actually expands on this a little bit more. He expands on this idea of the church being the body of Christ. Uh, because it's, it's, it's an issue that's coming up again and again for Corinth. He says, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. In the body of Christ, you don't have the arm going, I'm so much better than the leg. They're together, <laughs> working together working together to make the name of Jesus known together, needing the grace of God. I shared before about my um, experience in Wainwright. Uh, so again, I'm a little hesitant to share this example just because it's not, it has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper really, but I think again, it gets at that heart issue. So the first seven, eight months there, I'm just, uh, I'm miserable. I'm lonely, I'm complaining. Um, about eight months in, two of my buddies from Bible college come and they visit me for, uh, for a weekend in Wainwright. There, there we are. How could I not think that I was superior to everybody? Look at those, look at those glasses. Look at that beard. I mean, that's, that's it. You might know that Wainwright, uh, you might know that name because of the military base. There's just tanks everywhere. You know, you're just taking pictures with tanks. Um, so they came and visited me for, for a weekend. And I was like, they, you know, they came to some young adult events. They came to, uh, to church on Sunday. And I was, um, 
I was just complaining to them the whole time. Oh, guys, like, it's so terrible here. You know, I have, like, no friends and everything like that. And uh, by the end of the weekend, one of my buddies, Scott, he's on the, he's on the right there. He, uh, he was just like, Craig, shut up. Like, like he just kind of gave me a mat- metaphorical slap in the face. He's like, Craig, like, stop complaining. There are good people here. You've got brothers and sisters here. You don't need to be miserable. You don't need to be lonely. Aw. <laughs> and, and that to- actually totally transformed my perspective on things. Because Scott was like one of the coolest guys I knew. So, I mean, if he said that, I was like, well, then, I guess I should change the way I'm looking at this. And for the last two or three months, I just kind of opened my heart and it turned out that they were great people. <laughs> uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I found my place in this church and I just, just had a great last few months hanging out and it made leaving a lot more difficult. If I had stayed miserable, leaving would have been easy. Thanks a lot, Scott. That was a lot harder, but I, I, I loved them. I loved the town. I loved the church and, 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 and really connected with the people there in the end. So how, how, do, how, do we, how do we avoid that Corinthian sickness? How do, how do we avoid that, that social snobbery that comes so naturally to many of us? I think it comes back to going to the cross. I think again and again, it comes back to remembering the massive, unbridgeable gap that existed between us and God and that God in Christ Jesus took on flesh, went to the cross, shed his blood in our place for the forgiveness of our sins so that we would be able to be in a covenant relationship with God on the basis of faith. And if God has done that for us, then how can we not extend that grace to others, just keep on coming back to the cross. And it may sound unpopular, but, but remind yourself again and again how unworthy you are and yet the grace you have received. And so uh, I invite the worship team up. We're gonna practice, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna remember that this morning, unsurprisingly, by taking of the Lord's Supper. So we'll get the worship team up, get the, um, the servers, the communion servers up as well. I'm gonna pray and then, and then give us some instructions. As we prayed at the beginning, God, I I don't want us to hear these words that we often hear and for them to just kind of pass us by. God, I, I want us, I want us to feel the weight, the weight of the of the evil that actually exists in each one of us, the sin that exists in each one of us the ways that we view each other in these deeply flawed ways, the ways that we we live with pride, and we have no right to pride. And yet, God, we we live our lives trying to figure out where we we stand in the social ladder and the pecking order, and and we obsess over these things. And, And it's so crazy, Lord, because you are so great. You are so mighty. You are so awesome. You are so high above us. You reign above it all. That's what we were singing before. And yet because of your great love for us, and I don't get that, Lord. I don't get why you would love us so much, but you do because of your great love and mercy for us. You sent your son, Jesus, and Jesus shed his blood so that we could enter into covenant with you. I pray, God, that the weight of that would hit us in a fresh way today. I pray that those, Lord, who have not known this, who have not heard this, would hear the good news and that they would know that it's true, that this is who you are. I pray for those, Lord, who maybe have known and heard, but have been guilty of that pride, including in how they view others. I pray for repentance. I pray for a softening of heart. And I pray, Lord, for our whole church, that we would be a church that is truly one body, not divided on the basis of status or money or age even, or any of that stuff, Lord, but that we would be one body together tied by your grace. I pray you remind us of that again this morning as we take the bread and drink the cup. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us at the Bridge Church in this way. If God has spoken to you through his word, or if you're wanting to reach out to pray, or just wanting to know more about our church, access our website. There, you can connect with us and also have access to other contents. We are a church that lives to know Jesus Christ personally and to make him known. We believe that he is the hope of the world and wants to give you hope as well. We believe the best news ever has come in and through him. May you know him more and make him known today. We'd love to hear from you.